So today's video we're going to start with doing the printed circuit board for the replica of the banned Taiwanese power supply from 1981. And so we're going to start by doing the uh, printed circuit board in the kind of um, normal way that I do them, bearing in mind part of our business is in church pipe organ restoration and some of those church pipe organs have got electric action and some of those we decide to use solid state electronic action that we developed in the 1980s. So we do make printed circuit boards. But we don't need that many, you know, 30 is a maximum, so we may as well use these low type production methods using a photographic process. Now, there was some comment, are you going to use the uh, uh, toner transfer method? And the answer to that is no, it hasn't been successful for me, but this is quite a simple pattern and it might well work using the toner transfer method. There's lots of people showing how that's done and you just need a laser printer and some special paper. So we're going to do this the uh, photosensitive method. So first of all, we started off with the Mr. Chippy took the printer circuit board off and we this was off a working one and what we did was to scan that and that's our printout of our scan. Then what he's done is to using one of these paint type programs, he has produced that. And from doing that, getting it back to the right size, we have that, and then it's printed onto acetate like that. So it's now see-through. And I've done two because we're going to be using this piece of printed circuit board that I just happen to have got some surplus in stock, which I bought 20 years ago. And we keep this in the fridge because it, being a photographic thing, it does go off. It may not work, but we're trying to use these until we buy some expensive stuff from RS. I think they're £1.60 each, and I don't think Hills have done electronic components for years and years. So the first thing we need to do is to expose these to ultraviolet light. So I've done two of these uh, masters. We could have got three on the board, but um, there you go, I've done two. So that is special acetate for use with an inkjet printer. We find that the inkjet printer works better than the laser printer because you get a more solid print than you do with the laser printer. So this comes, it's a fiberglass board and it comes with a protective coating, protective film, which I need to hope we can get off. And so these are 20 years old and the chances of these working is about 50-50 despite keeping them in the fridge. So that has now exposed the emulsion side. What we have here I just move this down. Oh, there's the weed killer. In fact, I'll pause the camera and put it in a better position. So what we have here is an ultraviolet light box. And we've got two of these. We've got a really small one, which we got from Maplin's many years ago, with a, sing uh, with a couple of eight inch ultraviolet fluorescence in. This is a bigger one. I think this is the Mega Electronics one. And so what we now have to do is to make sure we get these the right way around because it's going to be like that. That's why I've had input TSG for our business on there. Not trying to pinch the design, we've kept their PR16B, but at least we know whose, whose version it is. And I'll put the other one, I'll tell you what, if I cut these out, it'll be easier. We'll just pause the video. So there we are, I've placed it now face down, emulsion side down onto the light box. I can't remember what the timing is for this uh, printed circuit mold material. When you buy it, it does tell you what the exposure times are. Uh, and it's going to be a bit weaker, even if it works at all, than it would be when it was new. So we're guessing at three minutes. So I've set that three minutes and we'll let that count down you can 
can see there's a digital countdown timer there. So we'll come back to that in three minutes. Right, so we're loading up the box, that's done. And we should have, sometimes can see, if you get the angle right, you can usually see the pattern on the printed circuit board. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to develop that into, move the camera a bit. into this developer tank which is got sodium hydroxide solution in it so we just need to agitate that a bit it is a heated tank it doesn't need to be years old this board which I'm trying to use. So this is the other method we're going to use. This is the kitchen table method that you can do a lot more easily at home without expensive equipment. So I'm going to expose the board with the ultraviolet exposure box, just like I did when I used the proper equipment, shall we say. But you can place that same acetate under a piece of glass so it's tight against the printed circuit board blank and you can simply expose it by taking it outside and exposing it to, uh, to daylight for about 20 minutes. You may have to experiment with the exposure, but it can be done without, without the ultraviolet light box because you, there's enough ultraviolet light uh, in the light outside to expose the board. So that's your really cheap method. We've also experimented with a sunbed. That was another method. You needed less exposure for that because it was quite um, concentrated and of course there's much cheaper light boxes and you can make your own with UV tubes which are readily available so there can be a £15 way of making a light box uh, just with the UV fluorescent tubes in a box of your own choice so it doesn't have to be an expensive thing because I like all our things we do here to be approachable and not some kind of elitist thing so I'm going to expose the board as before. So this is a brand new board from RS Components and it's 418, 4180. It's a CIF product from France and it comes with an instruction leaflet which says with this board and with this film method, it's one and a half minutes exposure. Though it does advise that you might have to experiment with exposure time. So once again, we'll peel off the protective film. Like 
so. It's purple emulsion on this. And we'll pop that down on our master. This time we're setting this for 1 minute 30. Which I managed to overshoot. So that's the timer, we'll start counting down. So this is a brand new board from RS Components and it's 418, 4180, it's a CIF product from France and it comes with an instruction leaflet which says with this board and with this film method it's one and a half minutes exposure, though it does advise that you might have to experiment with exposure time. So once again we'll peel off the protective film like so it's purple emulsion on this and we'll pop that down on our master This time we're setting this for 1 minute 30. Which I managed to overshoot. So that's the timer, we'll start counting down. So the developer, this, these standard plastic trays are available, these ones came from Rapid Electronics, 530069, they look to be a German product. So we've had French printed circuit board, a British light box, a French, uh, a, a, a German uh, tray, and we're now going to use the Japanese developer. And as you can see, it says quite clearly in Japanese that that's going to work for three to four boards at 22 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll pour that into there and add 200 millilitres of water, which they want it to be at 20 to, what did this say, 20 to, uh, it's actually it's in this instruction book too, 20 to 23, 20 to 25, because our, um, our machine there, which we showed you, um, of course it's temperature controlled. So I will pour this powder, which is no doubt sodium hydroxide in some form or another. You know my late father was a doctor of chemistry and when I started doing these uh, photo X printed circuit boards, I was, uh, I was only 17, 56 now. And it was so easy because my dad mixed all the chemicals for me. <laughs> no one, no wonder they were good results, better results than I get now. So what we're going to do is add 200 millilitres of water, which we're going to make sure is at that 20 to 25 degree centigrade. To make sure of that, put a small digital thermometer here with a remote probe.
So at the moment I put my jug in the microwave for 15 seconds and I've ended up with it at 31. So by the time we've poured it into the dish and it's dissolved, I will wait until it does read at 25. I think that little bit of extra heat will help dissolve the chemical crystals. I really ought to have a, a um, glass stirring rod, but um, I'll go and find a plastic coffee stirrer. Or even a teaspoon. I really ought to put some newspaper on this light box, sloshing it over the sides. Right, I'll put the probe in there and see what we're getting now. Twenty-five point two. So I'll just uh, pause the camera and we'll just let that drop naturally. And uh, when it gets to, it's actually twenty-six point three at the moment. Uh, when it drops to twenty-five, we'll put the camera back on and we'll develop it. And I will put at least one glove on as a special treat. Okay, so we're now reading, what, 24.9 toggling 25, so I'll take that probe out. We've got the board from the ultraviolet unit and we'll now develop that. So we now have that on the printed circuit board. So now we need to use some we need to etch that. So I'll get the ferric chloride. This is a ready to use one from Mega Electronics, who don't seem to be around at the moment. I don't know whether they've disappeared. They actually say that suspending the board is best results. It hasn't always worked for me, but we'll certainly do that. Now this will take a lot longer than with the bubble etcher. So I'm going to come back to that in 20 minutes. So I've put it face down on this method at the moment. So after about 20 minutes, I, I turned it over because you remember it was face down. And you always end up with the odd air bubble or something in the pocket. So hopefully we've finished it off now. I could be using tongues. And there we have our printed circuit using this method. There we go. So that's all ready and we'll get that drilled and we'll put a, a coating on that. I don't do tin, um, you can use a tin bath solution, but the chemicals certainly from RS are 40 quid a time 
and it, I really don't need to do that. But some people do that. So that's shown both the methods. So to recap, we can use the, or we can use, because we have it, the two mega electronics machines there we've got the bubble latch on the left, we've got the uh, heated developer unit on the right and then there's the kitchen table method where we've just plonked that down, put a bit of the etchant in but it's a slower process, it's probably take, to be honest by the time I've got to get rid of the uh, the defect it was 45 minutes so it's, it's a slower way of doing it uh, but we can churn them out in 20 minutes from start to finish and when we're doing church organs and you, you, there's times we wanted 137 printed circuit boards. I could have them made but it's job satisfaction isn't it? So the next bit of the video we'll get, to, I don't know whether Mr Chippy's going to do the drilling, whether I'm going to do the drilling, but we're going to start drilling the holes. The other thing that can happen is this, one of those old boards has not come out, it's the uh, the emulsion on there is 20 years old, it hasn't worked out. So what we're going to do is I'm going to use a soap pad in the sink and there's some nice dirty water. So what I'm going to do is simply use a soap pad. In the UK I think Brillo is the leading brand. And rub the failed emulsion physically off the board so we're left with a copper clad plain board and you can also do this if you want to use ordinary copper clad board which hasn't been photo sensitized and you can sensitize it yourself so I'm just going to carry on scrubbing away and obviously we've got to let this dry and when it's properly dry we can use this spray which I've made in Belgium and I'll show you the results. So we're in Mr Chippy's workshop and he's drilling holes in the first of the printed circuit boards that we've produced. The plan is we're going to replace the pin printed circuit board where we took the one from with one of our new ones to prove the design doesn't have errors in it and then we'll put the components back and we'll make sure that power supply is then working of course that will be with new capacitors and then we can make up another board and we can pave our way to putting one together I've already got the cases uh, in stock to do our demonstration and that's one of these from Hammond if we can read that label so that should be it's a bit smaller than the 5 amp one but it's a bit bigger than the 3 amp one and seeing as the transformer we've chosen is about a 4 amp one that will fit nicely into what we're doing so we'll come back to that when he's put a few more holes in it so he's been through all the holes now once we're just making sure that the bigger holes are being drilled with the appropriate drills. So we're going through at the moment with 1.4 millimeter for the three amp diodes. And so we'll continue. The next thing I'll be spraying it with a solder coating. So I've just sprayed the green coating on the three printed circuit boards what we're starting off with. So next thing, we'll start putting the parts on for that power supply we took apart. So there we are, that's new my new board as opposed to the SRBP one which I took out. SRBP meaning synthetic resin, synthetic resin bonded paper, whereas mine one's a bit more tonka and is made out of fiberglass. So we'll put the parts on and I've decided we're going to put all new parts on. Uh, and then we'll fit that into the power supply cabinet it came out of. So fast forward 15 minutes and we've put all the brand new parts on. 
So, tell you what, let's see if we can compare that with another power supply we've got here. This one's so bad, it's got the two core mains lead. And that's my board, so I can't see a power resistor on that one. So there's, a, there's that white um, vertical thing is a, I think it's 0.18 of an ohm if I remember rightly or something like that and uh, it's 5 watt rated, I can't see that on, on theirs. Anyway, we'll put this board in the power supply that I took that board out of. Remember this was a fully working power supply but we wouldn't have used it without changing the four capacitors. That's all I needed to change because we wanted a working one so we could be absolutely sure of all the component values, especially that Zener. I know Radio Cruncher came to the conclusion it was 15 volt, but I wanted to prove it. So the next thing is we'll install our new board in our old power supply. So Mr Chippy's just making sure there's a bit of print oh. yeah copper's the word oh. <laughs> poking through we've put the case through the dishwasher and that's being mounted now on the original terminals which were intact on unusually intact on this particular power supply so we'll come back to this when we've uh, put a few more bits in right i've put it back together chippy's put a bit of it back together so it's going to be the moment of truth when we actually switch it on. So I'm going to put a test meter on. So I'd like to see something like 13.8. I think we can see that. Yes. Let's come out. So there's no load, remember, just the meter. Aha, uh -huh. it's lit up, but I haven't got any volts. So is that the terminals there? It's the prods loose in the terminals. There we go. What's that say? Nothing. Thirteen point seven five. Thirteen point eight. I should have put this on crocodile clips. Fourteen point oh one. That's no load. So well, we'll just add the bulb and then see what happens. without blowing myself up. So that's effectively a two amp load now. So if I, just to put across there, 13.45 on a two amp load. So that's about where we should be on that. Remember these are non-adjustable power supplies. I'm just feeling the temperature of the output transistor there and that's what you'd expect it's on a heat sink I'll put my finger on that um, 5 watt resistor and it's hardly warm so there we are so new one new board in it new innards new works and it's fine now we've got another one here and this is another one we'll be rebuilding behind the scenes and when you look at this one I'll just turn that off so we don't short it out When I dug this out, I'll just make sure we're in shot. I think we are. This printed circuit board is snapped in half and somebody's attempted to solder it together. So that will be another one where we'll be making in, uh, one of the new printed circuits. We'll take most of the parts off there, but the resistors and the capacitors we'll replace for new. 
So that's another one which is going to get resurrected. So we've got three to do immediately. And then part four of this video is going to be when I build one from scratch into the case which I showed you a little bit earlier, the Hammond case there. So, oh yes, yeah, so I've shrouded all these uh, connections. We've got the new fuse holder in. The mains go straight to the fuse holder, straight out of there to the switch. We're switching the live and not the neutral as it was into the transformer. Neutral, because it's a single pole switch, neutral goes straight to the transformer. Bearing in mind we're in the UK, so if you're not in the UK, the fuses are in the plugs here as well as in the um, the circuit breakers at the house. So this mains plug is fused at three amps and the actual power supply is fused at uh, one and a quarter with an anti-surge fuse. So you've got a fuse in the plug, you've got a fuse on there, and then hopefully <laughs> if the transformer has an internal overload fuse for temperature as well. So there we have it, the, uh, the print, new printed circuit in the old power supply and it lives to tell another tale, although this was a work and we stripped it down to be able to replicate it. The next ones will be the repairs. And I think we've got a, yes, we've done the, uh, we have done the Maxcom 7E, which will follow this. We've done the, the field test for that. So thank you for watching the Power Supply Project Part 3.